Thank you, Bob. Our guest uh, this afternoon, Michael Crichton, uh, whose latest book, uh, State of Fear, uh, is, uh, is something that is to be, uh, to be read and enjoyed and is doing very well, uh, but which he is not here to talk about, at least not uh, directly uh, today. Hails from Chicago, went to Harvard uh, College, is a graduate of the Harvard uh, Medical School, uh, and is uh, one of uh, the world's uh, most popular and best-selling uh, authors of uh, fiction, almost all of it uh, on subjects closely touching on uh, new scientific uh, developments. He is the author of uh, over a dozen uh, best-selling uh, novels, including The Andromeda Strain, Congo, Jurassic Park, uh, leading up to his current uh, state of fear, uh, an equal number of uh, movies. He has received uh, an Academy Award. Uh, his great uh, television show, uh, uh, which he uh, created, ER, uh, uh, brought him uh, uh, a number of awards, including the um, uh, Emmy Award, a Peabody Award, and a Writers Guild of America Award. His books have been uh, translated into 30 languages, have sold more than uh, 100 uh, million books. Uh, it is said that he is the only person ever to have had simultaneously uh, the number one novel, the number one movie, and the number one television show simultaneously. Uh, he has not yet provided a new and simpler solution to Fermat's last theorem, written and starred in a Broadway show, or sailed solo around the world, much less simultaneously, uh, but anyone who has followed his career uh, would be uh, uh, entirely unsurprised if, we, if he were to accomplish those things as well. Why is it that such a uh, glamorous uh, individual is consorting with uh, chin strokers such as ourselves at a uh, think tank? Uh, the reason is uh, that this uh, gentleman who has uh, been able to convey serious uh, science uh, with a sense of drama to a broad popular audience uh, better than uh, anyone else uh, in uh, uh, contemporary times has grown increasingly concerned about the C.P. Snow problem, uh, the divergence between what is uh, going on uh, in serious science and the way uh, science is talked about in policy debates uh, concerning uh, climate change, uh, genetics, uh, uh, genetic uh, research and eth ethical issues. Uh, not a week goes by uh, when an individual who is uh, deeply immersed uh, in the science of subjects such as these will not be dismayed at the treatment that they receive in the popular press and sometimes, and I must say increasingly, even in some uh, technical uh, journals. Uh, the reasons for these uh, difficulties are, are very deep uh, and uh, there has been nobody who has been addressing them more arrestingly uh, in recent years than uh, Michael Crichton. And he has even, in state of fear, uh, taken the bull by the horns to attempt to write a popular drama uh, whose ma basic subject is the absence of a crisis. And uh, if he can succeed with that, uh, he will have advanced uh, debates on these uh, larger issues, uh, which he will be discussing today in his talk entitled Science Policy in the 21st Century. Please, everyone, give a warm welcome to Michael Crichton. Thank you, Chris and Bob. I'm delighted to be here. Um, and the, if I seem at all nervous, it's because I'm worried about working a PC. I'm a Mac person. <laughs> <clears throat> As some of you know, I spent the last several years exploring um, environmental issues, particularly global warming. I've been deeply disturbed by what I found largely because the evidence for so many environmental issues is, from my point of view, shockingly flawed and unsubstantiated. But more troubling to me 
is the degree to which the political process seems to have captured and often corrupted the integrity of the scientific research that's used to formulate policy and to inform policy decisions. I'm also troubled by the insensible and distracting contentiousness that seems to inform so much of current political debate, especially when environmental issues are involved. As a result of all this political friction, which is all heat and no light, policy is often established by litigation rather than negotiation and legislation. From these observations, I conclude that as a society, we lack tools and methodologies that we need to resolve thorny science policy issues promptly, equitably, and constructively. We're having this trouble because we have not developed mechanisms for decision making that we can all agree are fact-based and judicious so that the results of such a process will be generally perceived to be fair and equitable. As a result, as I've mentioned, we often resolve environmental disputes through litigation, which is neither good public policy nor a sound basis for administrative rulemaking. So we ought to establish new mechanisms for determining social policy, and I believe that in the not too distant future, we will. Today I'm going to focus on six major problems that will confront science policy in the 21st century, and then consider briefly how we might resolve each of them. Now we begin with this. Uh-huh, didn't work. Isn't technology great? I'm removing that. Oh, I'm going backwards. Six questions for the future. First question is, how do we obtain good and unbiased information? Second question, how do we set policy in uncertainty? When do we choose to prevent and when do we adapt? How do we promote desirable technologies? How do we regulate a knowledge society? Something, in my view, almost no one is really thinking about. And finally, can we manage complex natural systems? To me, the most important of all these issues. Okay, first, how do we obtain good, unbiased information? Traditionally, policymakers have trouble getting good information. The problem is especially acute with scientific decisions because the issues are complex and the policymakers are not usually trained in science. In addition, the staffs feeding policymakers often give them deliberately biased information in an effort to make a partisan case. In the process, these staffs are doing us a double disservice. They are both preempting the policymakers' traffic cop role and they are violating the integrity of the firewall that should always stand between those gathering information and those setting policy based on it. The issue here is not simply the avoidance of bias. The issue is how to avoid bad information. In areas of contention, critical and profoundly flawed influential information is often astoundingly present. By way of illustration, I'm going to discuss a recent example from climate science and also show you a graph, the so-called hockey stick graph. I think many of you will be familiar with this. Here's how the hockey stick graph came to public attention. In 1998, an American climate scientist named Michael Mann, along with his co-workers, published an estimation of global temperatures from, oh dear, Sorry about that. What, is it just going by itself now? Is that what it does? Oh. <laughs> well, you, you know where I'm going, so. I guess I have to set it down very carefully. It's sort of like <laughs> nitroglycerin. In 1998, they published a study uh, which attempted to, to estimate temperatures from the year 1000 to the present using 112 proxy studies. These, uh, by proxy studies, I mean tree ring and isotope and ice core studies that are, are intended to provide a indirect measurement of temperature in the time before thermometers existed. Man's results appeared to show a spike in recent temperatures that was unprecedented in the last 1,000 years. And you see it there on the far right-hand side. As a result, 
His report achieved immediate and worldwide fame. It also formed the centerpiece of the UN's third assessment report in, in 2001. That's the third assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Mann's assessment of the data was criticized on several fronts. The first was historical fact. His chart didn't appear to show the well-known medieval warm period or the so-called Little Ice Age that occurred in the 1500s. This his advocates explained by saying those were European but not global phenomena. That started a hunt through historical records in China and elsewhere. And now I think many people are inclined to believe that the sharp rise and equally sharp fall in medieval temperatures was indeed a global phenomenon. The next chapter in the story began when two Canadian researchers, McIntyre and McKittrick, obtained Mann's data and repeated his study. They found what they considered to be numerous, grave, and astonishing errors in Mann's work, which they detailed in 2003. This is one page of the listings, which I can't read what it says. <laughs> but for example, they, they found the two statistical series in the study shared the same data. The data had apparently been inadvertently copied from one series to another. In addition, 19 other series had had gaps in the data, which Mann's team had filled in, a fact that had not been disclosed. In addition, all 28 tree ring studies had calculation errors, and so on and so forth. Such that in the end, the Canadians' corrected graph looked quite different. Man's original graph is the dark line, and the corrected graph is the red line. And as you see, uh, just looking quickly, it suggests that the current temperature rise and the current state of global temperature as, as contemporaneously measured is very far from the warmest it's been um, in the last thousand years. And indeed, some of you may have noticed that the, that the discussion has shifted from year X is the warmest year in the last thousand years to year X is the warmest year in the instrumental record, which doesn't quite have the same ring. But there were more problems to come. Man's statistical approach to the data was somewhat unusual and raised questions about the validity of the formula that he used to do his meta-study. When researchers tested Mann's formula, which they did by feeding it a table of trendless numbers, the so-called Monte Carlo procedures that you do with a computer, what they found was that any table of trendless numbers would produce a hockey stick graph one of these graphs is the man graph. The others are all from trendless numbers. If you can't tell which is which, that's the problem with this study. That's one of the several large problems with this study. Man's work has been attacked by a number of labs around the world. It's been called phony and a shocker and rubbish by climate scientists who believe in global warming and who are concerned that such sloppy work might undermine the legitimacy of the claim that global warming is a dangerous and alarming fact. As indeed it, it has undermined it, although I would say very little. But to my mind, the real point of this story is that the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, accepted Mann's study without question and without independent review. And therein lies the real warning to policymakers, because even the most widely touted and allegedly reputable studies may be significantly less reliable and some substantive than they initially appear. One of the things that's going on here, I think, is that there is a public perception that uh, results in science are independent, independently verified and confirmed. And the reality is that most studies are not. A very, very small number of them are, are verified. So you can't just assume that because it's been published in a journal that it's right. 
So bad data is out there, and severely biased studies are out there, and policymakers have the unenviable task of separating the wheat from the chaff. You remember what Adlai Stevenson said? He said that newspapers are, have the ability to separate the wheat from the chaff and print the chaff. <laughs> In that vein, I know of only three strategies that are useful in the effort to approve the rigorousness of data and verify its integrity. Two of these strategies are already well known and well established, and the third will, in my view, soon become reality. I called the, oh, I'm so nervous with this thing. I called the, the first strategy the FDR tactic. Let the participants air their views and slug it out. Franklin Roosevelt was famous for inciting conflict and confrontation between his advisors. And he made sure that when his people fought the issues out, they did it in front of him. In addition, he always maintained two separate and discrete sets of advisors. The first was made up of the members of his cabinet. The second was comprised of assorted friends, mentors, and cronies. The variety of views, prejudices, and motives thus exposed made for an incisive and effective information management technique. But the closest that we now come to that level of inquiry and its exposure of partisan bias and equivocal advocacy is the dog and pony show of congressional testimony. And those hearings tend to be more concerned with deference than the determination of fact. They reflect the chair's obsession with process, not product. Questions are neither penetrating nor challenging, nor are the answers that members accept either instructive or informative. Congress lobs softballs at witnesses, not hand grenades. Questions designed to elicit a specific response that will prove the member's point, support the member's stance, and assuage and placate the member's constituents. But this is a cruel farce. This is showbiz, not the people's biz. This is vaudeville, not democracy. Far better for policymakers to create a forum in which opponents can engage in direct debate, the much touted free marketplace of ideas. Insisting the debates be public is also a good idea, as sunlight always has a sanitizing effect. And a prolonged series of debates in which the opponents knew they would face each other again would be extremely helpful. Why? Well, to cite just one example, there is at present no good public forum in which to debate and evaluate climate data in an atmosphere of aggressive and penetrating inquiry, full of challenge and true debate. A second procedure, I say this very hesitantly to these days, a second procedure would be To, oh, I'm sorry. A second way to, to do the FDR kind of um, um, arranged conflict would be to, uh, to let out grants for research to multiple laboratories at the same time. I really don't know why this isn't done. In, in areas where policy is very important, you, you don't just give the, the research grant to one lab, you give it to three, and you make sure the two of them are strongly opposed to each other. You tell them all that each, each lab will get to review the other's data. You tell them all that they will be published simultaneously. You tell them all that the publication will include the responses of the other labs to their work. And you tell them all that simultaneous to publication in a journal, they will publish their data on the net. If you did that, an enormous amount of baloney that now takes place would be over. <laughs> of course, it's more expensive. But let's face it, bad information is also very expensive, especially when it leads to bad policies. But more to the point, I think, is that the idea that a single study can be used to set policy, or a single set of studies from a, from a particular lab, is really outdated. I mean, we just can't do it anymore. And I want to make the argument, I think it's already true, but I want to make the argument that, um, that government-funded research 
ought to be publicly available. I, I don't see why this stuff isn't on the net at the time of publication. I don't see why anybody has to sue any laboratory to get their data. I don't understand, you know, the people have paid for it, the people own it. You know, let's, let, let's clarify this. And, I, and in terms of this, you know, I really am astounded now. It seems to me that we are ready to hold the heads of corporations to a higher standard of information than we are the heads of laboratories. You know, and frankly, if, if one scientist who is the head of a laboratory went to jail, that would be, you know, enormously useful. <laughs> I, I know this um, because I come from the movie business, and I'll, I'll tell you a short story. It works there, too. Uh, in, the, in the 1970s, the, uh, the MGM was making a movie of Cannery Row, and they were having a lot of trouble with their then star, Raquel Welch, so they fired her. At this time, no one had ever fired a major star from a movie in, in years and years and years. It just hadn't happened. She sued MGM, um, and the lawsuit was dragging on. But what was of interest was that every single movie star in Hollywood was suddenly on time. <laughs> they were out of their trailers. They were there. And, and you know, when X many years later, MGM had to pay off the lawsuit because they had a contract that they'd breached. You know, the movie business as a whole had saved an enormous amount of money. So I've said to, I've said to uh, the heads of studios that what they should do uh, is, is fire somebody every so often, but they're unwilling to do it. Let's move on. Um, a second method of securing reliable data is the one that we might call the FDA strategy. It's a, it's a methodology which intends to remove all potential bias from the process that gives us information. So <clears throat> I know the FDA is having some troubles at the moment. We, we can speak about them in a sort of um, idealized way. The, the core of the FDA is that, is that uh, you do double-blind studies for, for demonstrations of drug efficacy. And let me review exactly what a double-blind study is. <clears throat> it means that the group uh, that puts the drugs into the bottles, the drugs in the placebo, does not know the group that administers it to the patients. It means that the physicians who assess the effect of drug A or drug B on the patients is not the same as the group that administered it. And it means that the group that analyzes the results does not know any of the other groups. And by does not know, it means they don't know them. It, it means they've never met. It means they're in different cities and preferably in different countries. They're really separated. I can tell you that if there were this kind of double-blind assessment of climate models, that there would be no discussion about global warming today. The data is nowhere near good enough. The models are nowhere near skillful enough to withstand that kind of analysis. We require it <clears throat> for our drugs, but we're talking about spending trillions of dollars. And nobody is willing to, to subject that information to the, to the kind of intense scrutiny that we require of a drug. I, I find it sort of inexplicable. <clears throat> Third method for vetting data is on the horizon. It's not here yet, but I should tell you that I'm a guy who in 1984 wrote a book called Electronic Life, and I said, you know, the, the, um, the digital world is coming, and when it does, there's going to be huge problems with copyright. And everybody went, <sighs> And I said, you know, there's going to be um, the major use of computers is going to be in communication because there's going to be all these networks and users are going to be able to talk to each other and all these things will happen. There'll be and reporters went, well, what do you mean networks? What do you mean? So what I'm going to say now is we're going to have product liability for information. It started. Um, it's in a few small areas and we're going to have it uh, in more areas. And we need it. We live in an information society. <clears throat> Nearly one American in three is a knowledge worker. More people 
are knowledge workers in this society than work in manufacturing. By and large, what the knowledge workers do is generate information. Our society is totally dependent on information. And yet we still don't define information as a product. And as a result, information has, in a sense, if, if you want to put it in those terms, it's evaded the quality revolution. But I think that product liability for information is already being enforced for maps and charts. Uh, it's being discussed for sort of remote sensing things. And it'll soon be applied to other forms of information as well. I have, I, I sense that the temperature just went down a little bit in this room. I don't know if that's true. But one way or another, whether, whether we, oh, here's the dreaded thing again. Um, whichever one of these or groups of these strategies we use, we're going to have to do something to get better information than we've done in the past. It's, it, it's absolutely essential for the future. Now, how do we set policy in, in uncertainty? Most of you probably know this quotation from Samuel Butler. Life is the art of drawing sufficient conclusions from insufficient premises. <clears throat> he said this 350 years ago, so um, it's, a, it's certainly a truism. If anything is more true today, a great many decisions can't be made with confidence not necessarily because the data is biased, but because the data doesn't exist at all. An example that I will speak of only briefly because a lot of people in this room know about it or have worked in it is arsenic regulation. <clears throat> arsenic is a known carcinogen. It's a naturally occurring substance. It's found in three parts of the United States, the Northeast, uh, the Michigan area, and the Southwest. So it, it affects, therefore, just a fraction of the, of the American population. Uh, since the 1920s, the arsenic level has been set at 50 parts per billion. Uh, new data coming out of ta Taiwan in the last few decades where arsenic levels are hugely higher than they are here, uh, suggested to many people that the, that the level had to be set lower. In the waning days of the Clinton administration, they set it at 10 parts per billion. The Bush administration thought it should be higher and tried to push it to 20. Uh, it went to the National Research Council, which suggested it ought to be three, if I have that right. Is that right? Yeah. And, uh, and uh, this, this joint organization has had things to say about it. And I believe, uh, I believe it's now at 10, which the, uh, the National Research Defense Council says is on its website is because of industry pressure. So some of you people here are in industry. But my point is that, is that based on the evidence that we have, <clears throat> you could actually make a <clears throat> good, excuse me, you could make a good case for 50, 20, 10, or 5 parts per billion. We don't have the kind of decisive evidence that would lead us one way or, to, or another. And in that situation, and in a situation where the, the cost differential is enormous, <clears throat> the difference between 20 parts per billion and three parts per billion, I believe, is close to three quarters of a billion dollars. So the argument that I would make is simply because we don't have the information is not a reason for us to think we can't get it. And you might actually reduce contentiousness if you set a policy and start an epidemiological study. Now, in the case of arsenic, this is going to be a very long-range study. The arsenic cancers develop late in life. Um, the, many of them are not fatal, so it's going to be, you know, you, you may be talking about a 100-year study, but so what? You know, and if it costs you a million dollars, big deal, because it's a lot better to spend a million dollars and set your level at, at a certain higher point and review it again in 10 or 20 years or 30 years than it is to commit to the three-quarters of a billion dollars, because, as we know, there is a cognitive illusion that all human beings have, and that is, <clears throat> and it's very well demonstrated in the psychological literature, people will spend vastly more for what they regard as 100% safety than they will for 95% or 98%. It's a very rational step, but, but it, is, it is somehow in our brains. 
And as policy people, we have to fight it. <clears throat> I want to talk briefly. So anyway, that's the notion that we're going to tie research to policy. <laughs> this is going to lead to more flexibility and review of, uh, of our standards. But you know, it happens anyway. Um, <clears throat> a lot of what I have to say comes from my own life. And uh, I bought a house in 1988. And for two weeks, I had guys in spacesuits going around taking the, the uh, asbestos out. And no one could go near, and they were monitored. And it was just, it was an atomic thing. It was something out of one of my movies. <laughs> Two years ago, I bought a house, and they came and they said, well, you know, there's, there's some asbestos in the basement. And I said, oh, my God, what do we do? And they said, don't worry about it. The, some people came and took it in, you know, a couple hours. So our, whole, our idea about abatement, you know, has changed enormously in some of these areas. And I think it behooves us to institute greater flexibility and, and plan to, to review it to a degree that we don't now. When do we prevent and when do we adapt? Very contentious issue, um, especially in environmental circles, where the precautionary principle is um, popular. There are some instances in which prevention is really the obvious best strategy. Oil slicks, radiation leaks, exposure to lead, exposure to pathogens. So the conversion to double hull tankers and vaccination, all that makes sense. <clears throat> but inevitably, things still go wrong. And when they do, we simply adapt. The precautionary principle I notice is erratically applied. Many of my friends who um, want to label or ban genetically modified food because it hasn't been adequately tested communicate with fellow advocates with cell phones, which haven't been adequately tested. <laughs> or at least they've never been proven safe. So over time, I have actually developed an affinity for adaptation as opposed to prevention, both as a coping mechanism and as a policy predicate. I believe it's the better strategy. And <clears throat> in the immortal words of Mark Twain, I've seen a heap of trouble in my life, and most of it never came to pass. In addition, there's the work of the late Aaron Wildoski, who said uh, in a very complicated analysis that you can read, and I think, I think it's in Searching for Safety, he said, the, the strategy of prevention favors the elites, adaptation favors the average person. How do we promote desirable technologies? My answer is we don't. It's a, this is a tough lesson. I don't know why we haven't learned it. My notes are out of order, excuse me. We've had two major crash programs in this country involving technology and they were hugely successful. The first was the Manhattan Project leading the atomic bomb. The second was Kennedy's push to land people on the moon within 10 years. Neither of them involved broad scale changes in the society or the adoption of uh, some kind of new consumer product. As far as I know, every other uh, program to promote technologies has failed. You know, beginning with LBJ's war on cancer, where, where people whispered in his ear, you know, it's not really the same as going to the moon. You're talking about advancement of fundamental knowledge and things like that. You're not going to be able to just buy it. You're not going to be able to ram it. And concluding with, um, I'm from California, so in 1990, California decided that they were going to mandate 2% uh, of their vehicles to be electric in 1998 and 10% in 2004. And um, that didn't work at all, actually. I think the situation in California is actually rather, rather stark. California had enormous, a huge range of options in order to improve um, air quality and reduce emissions. 
They could raise the price of gasoline. They could get old cars off the road. They could formulate land policies that would discourage long commutes. But as Marion Keller pointed out, the state had, did not have the guts to do any of these things. Instead, they petulantly demanded electric cars, and when they didn't get them, everybody cried conspiracy. <laughs> the truth is, the public would have nothing to do with electric cars, and, and the public is fully enthusiastic about environmentally positive devices, including transportation devices. I mean, the, the waiting list for hybrids in California now is six or eight months. But hybrids make sense to people, electric cars didn't. Okay, you know, this is, this is a long-standing thing. I don't know why. I mean, I, I think probably everybody understands that, that legislators ought to specify outcomes and not procedures, but time and again, they decide, you know, they want to be in the car business. How do we regulate a knowledge society? Uh, I'm very interested in this because it seems to me nobody is talking about it. It's the, one of the least examined issues that we have. When you look back at ideas about the future in the early 20th century, they almost always involve the assumption of central planning. And many of those assumptions have actually come to pass, uh, not always with good results. This is a uh, picture from the 1930 movie, uh, Things to Come, based on the um, H.G. Wells' novel, which was the shape of things to come. And as you can see, it actually looks quite a bit like the, the lobby of the Hyatt in San Francisco. <laughs> and this is, this is Richard Neutra's uh, design for the city of the future. And um, to the extent that this is followed, of course, it's a, been a horror story. But uh, the, the point I'm trying to make here is that Central planning is, is implicit in the visualization of all this. This is an ad from the 1930s. Norman Bel Geddes was a, was a very uh, famous designer at that time, and um, it promised you a wonderful city of the future, which would be planned. And we would no longer have stop and go four miles out of five. That worked out. <laughs> now, by the 1980s, uh, you can't see it very well. This is a picture from Blade Runner, a little different movie. And what Blade Runner suggested was that the future was going to be a hodgepodge, that it was not going to be controllable, that things were just going to kind of spring up almost organically with lots of juxtapositions and lots of disconnects. Very different from this kind of image from the, from the shape of things to come, which aside from its kind of uh, neo-Roman empire, uh, garb, you know, clearly suggests that, that you know, we're going to have this kind of design. This is, this is the Blade Runner vision, you know, much more Asian, much more, and for something that's 25 years old, I mean, it's spot on, actually. There's plenty of places in the world that look exactly like this. The point that I want to raise today is that there are all kinds of ways, I think, where where people who are trying to regulate and do planning that they feel or that actually is important for the management of society are still living in the world of the picture on the left. They're still imagining all kinds of central control and central planning that actually really isn't going to be possible. You know, um, we, we've had hard lessons. You may be able to control manufacturing when it's in automobile plants that don't move and don't are huge and don't go anywhere. Uh, we've learned uh, to, our, to our sad discovery that even a technology as complex and expensive as nuclear power and nuclear fission cannot be controlled, it cannot be contained. Uh, and then when you turn and look at something like biotechnology, which can be done in a garage with a few hundred dollars worth of equipment, what, I mean, Really, when you get down to it, what are we going to do about biotechnology? How are we going to control it? And if we can't, I mean, if we really can't, and it looks to me like we really can't, then 
How are we going to try and manage that? Hmm. And I don't want to talk about it, but I mean, there's a similar kind of issue that has to do with healthcare, and um, and I, you know, the only thing that I would say about it is, that, you know, when I was a, when I was training as a physician in the uh, late '60s, and we were spending then, I think, 11 percent of GDP on healthcare, which everybody thought was an outrageous, ridiculous sum of money. Um, there was the assumption that by the time I got to the age that I was, we would have some kind of arrangement, national arrangement for health, whatever you wanted to call it. We don't. And, uh, and the only thing that I would say is that I noticed that, as far as I can tell, no country in the world has solved this problem well. If, so again, going back to the notion of central management, this is Silicon Valley. All you have to do is look at it. One of the horror, th you know, the sort of nightmares that I have is what if the government really ran Silicon Valley? You know, we would have computer processing speeds, you know, the way they were in 1965. But how could you, how could you manage that? How can you control that? And what are we going to do instead? So there's an assumption of central control. Is the reality of the knowledge society, which is it's really bubbling up from all kinds of places, a far more organic sort of situation. Control is much more difficult than it would be in past versions of society, and planning, I think, is impossible. You guys can argue with me. Now, my final question is: Can we manage complex natural systems? The the core of my the intellectual basis of my problem with most environmental thought is that it's enormously out of date in terms of science. If you, if you imagine the, the time of environmental awareness to start with the first Earth Day in 1970, just to, give, just to put a number on it, uh, between 1970 and now, science has changed phenomenally as a result of our ability to think about and to understand better um, nonlinear dynamics and complex systems. And what we understand is that this environment is a complex system. Um, and our views about it, because of our understanding of complex systems, are totally changed from what they were in 1970. Totally changed. I mean, uh, unrecognizably, in truth. We used to believe that um, there was something called the balance of nature. And the balance of nature, a Greek notion, um, informed almost all thinking. It informed, for example, the notion that what you needed to do with a lot of nature was get people out of them. If you could just get people away, if you could just sort of wall off natural, natural places and leave them alone, everything would be fine. It's now quite clear that that's not true at all, and that the the, uh, there is no balance of nature. Uh, there never was a balance of nature. And if you leave a forest alone, probably what will happen is it'll, it'll grow, decay, you know, become filled with pests and burn down. And it will burn down with such heat that it will sterilize the ground and something completely different will come up. And we also know that the world that white men saw when they first came to the New World was something they didn't understand at all. It was a world that was entirely altered by the native peoples who were there at the time. They were burning down the plains. They were burning down the old growth forest. There was more old growth forest in California today than there was in 1850. The Indians didn't like old growth because it didn't support enough game. They burned it down. So what, what people saw as nature had been very much managed by, by people who were true students of nature. And we've come in and imposed these ideas. Uh, we don't live in nature anymore. We live in cities. And we don't really know anything about nature. And those of us who even go camping are in for a huge shock. So, so we're you know, imposing intellectual notions on a, on a landscape that, by the way, doesn't care what we think. 
and it's been kind of disastrous. If you read Austin T Chase's book on the history of Yellowstone Park, Playing God in Yellowstone, it's a horror story, and it's a 100-year horror story. And we now have raw sewage bubbling out of the ground in Yellowstone. We must be doing something wrong. We need to understand that left alone wilderness changes. And if that's the case, then the whole situation of man to nature is now changed. It's a very, very difficult problem for extant environmental groups to, to address because it's, it's turned so many things upside down. What it really implies is that if we're going to have this pretty picture here, which is what everybody likes, if we're going to have a landscape that's good for hiking or for fishing or for viewing wild animals, I mean, Yellowstone Park was what it was when it became a park because the Indians hunted the elk and the moose to the edge of extinction. That's why it looks so good. And as soon as the white men came in and went, oh, no, no, we can't do that. We're not going to kill all those. They, they changed the ecology. The beaver vanished. This long cascade of messes began. If we're going to manage it, one of the questions that people have raised is, is are human beings capable of managing complex systems? There's been a lot of philosophical thought about that. A guy named Dietrich Dorner in Germany actually did some research. And he found that, yes, we can. Now, what he had was, um, I'll try and briefly describe it. He had computer um, models for a number of environments. There was a Saharan environment. There was a, a town in Maine. And he brought in various academics to run these environments for a period of 10 years. And what happened is that almost everybody ran the environment into the ground and made it vastly worse than it had been when they started. You know, they, they destroyed the water table. You know, they produced all kinds of strikes and terrible things in Maine. And um, some people didn't. Some people were good. Some people were successful. And so Dorner looked at what the strategies of the people who succeeded were and how they differed from the strategies of the people who failed. And what he found was that the people who succeeded waited a little longer to start. They gathered information, not too much, but they gathered information. Once they began, they looked for unexpected consequences. They looked for something to pop up out, you know, at the edge of their field of view, something they didn't think was going to happen. As time went on in managing the system, they made more and more and more decisions. They were more and more interactive. The people who failed came in with a philosophical point of view. They established their, their procedures based on what they thought, and they left it alone. As it, started to fa as it started not to work, because that's what would happen, they blamed whatever they blamed and, and made fewer and fewer decisions because by now they were in a failure mode. It doesn't work to manage, to manage complex systems according to a philosophical point of view. Now, what I would say is that we all know this. Because the one complex system that all, almost all of us have knowledge of is children. And, you know, anybody who just applies democratic or republican principles to their kid and walks away, you know, will soon be visiting them in jail. What we know is that as a complex system, it is continuously interactive. You have to be watching it constantly. You have to be adjusting and moving as it does this, you do that. And it's a never ending process. These days, really never ending. So, a friend of mine once said that it's only after they get out of college that they really start to cost you money. So it's the conclusion of Dorner that, uh, that there are strategies to manage complexity that they can be learned, they can be taught, uh, but they're not necessarily natural to us. And, um, and I think the, the last consequence of, of the way of looking at the environment that I'm talking about is that we're talking about an environmental strategy that's going to be stupefyingly expensive. It's going to really, really cost a lot of money to manage 2.2 million acres in Yellowstone and make it look good. And, you know, I, I, I was interested to discover that you can, 
you can get a pass to all the national parks in the United States for a year for $50. But you'll actually spend more than that for one day of fishing in Scotland, where they have this kind of management. So there's a huge expense to absorb. I just want to say, Mark Twain said, it's a terrible death to be talked to death. But I just want to say, in, in closing, uh, people have asked me, you know, I've been touring talking about this book, and um, they said, how has it been? And, I, and I'd like to report to you um, that something I find increasingly odd, which is that we now seem to live in a world, and I've, I've talked in, in England too, and it's the same there, where almost no one can think about the environment in any terms except political. You know, the most common thing that I've been asked is, well, of course, this is, you know, you're just doing George Bush's agenda. And I say, well, no, actually I'm not. But I, I happen to think he's right on this point, but it's an accident. I'm following the data. And people look at me like, well, what kind of, what kind of an idea is that? <laughs> you know, and, and it's really weird, you know, and you start to, to say, well, what about this? And let's look at this. And, and they, and they, and they look at you as if you're doing something very odd. You know, like, why do you want me to look at a graph? You know, what, you know or, or you're tricking me. This is, a, you know, it, this is data. Data is not Democratic or Republican, it's data. So it, it's an odd world we live in. And I would really like to get the political psychodrama out of decision making, at least in the environmental area. I'm sure that's, you know, that's a really naive hope, but it is my hope. And thank you very much for listening to me, and uh, thanks for having me here. <laughs> we'll, we'll, uh, Chris will we'll take questions. I don't know. That's a, that's a trick. It's a, it's a mic, but it's not on. I don't know. Better speak loudly. I can repeat the question if that helps. Okay. Um, it's Frank Prisnar, Prison Incorporated. Uh, I just wanted to comment on the uh, impact that Hollywood has on research, specifically in laboratories, and whether, in general, we think this is good or, or not. That's kind of a broad question, but... Given your background, I think you're qualified to answer. The impact of Hollywood, the question is the impact of what, impact, what Hollywood has on research. What impact does Hollywood have on research? Do you mean in terms of funding or in terms of the kind of image making that's done? Let's say that the image and, and how people act in a research environment based on what they see in the movies. Yeah. Well, you know, it's it's really funny because um, I. I spoke to the AAAS about this because they were wound up about the image of science in, in movies and I told them to relax. You know, the, in the famous words of Hitchcock, it's just a movie. The, um, the reality is that the scientific process can't be well represented in a movie. I mean, even if you look at you know, something like CSI, which is a sort of quasi-scientific thing, um, science is a search. You know, science is a process of discovery and it, and it goes on for a very long period of time, none of which movies want. You know, they don't like searches, searches are boring. They, you know, mo the, uh, what movies really want is a chase, preferably in something really fast. So, um, and with, you know, people with very little clothing. So, <laughs> so science is ill-suited and they tend to, um, they tend to short circuit it. You know, you probably noticed if you see a scene in which someone is lecturing, you always enter the scene at the end of the lecture. And the professor sort of say, you know, see you next Tuesday and bring your... And, and that's how the scene begins. Ron Ford with Stratico, I'm just curious, having worked in the Hollywood community myself, uh, experienced yet uh, any shunning of your Hollywood colleagues because of your latest book and the stance that you're uh, taking and do you think it'll risk uh, any uh, uh, future nominations for Academy Awards? 
Um, yeah, I, uh, it's interesting. The temperatures dropped. The um, at least around me, the attitude that I, you know, Diogenes always said, "What good is a philosopher who doesn't annoy anybody?" Um, <laughs> I, I view most of what Hollywood does as uh, the bad, the the unpleasant way to put it is pandering. The nice way to put it is conventional. Um, I'm sort of contrarian by nature, and you know I don't believe most of what I'm told. So, uh, so I'm already considered odd. But um, but you know it's interesting when uh, I think that that in general Hollywood is like most of the rest of the country, which is that in terms of the environment they have an attitude, but they don't have any information. Have you put any thought into the ways you might adjust the financial and social incentives to get activists, the professionals who make a living from dealing with these questions, to move in your direction? <coughs> the, uh, I mean, so far, you offer arguments, fine. Yeah. What about incentives? Yeah. Um, I can't do everything. You know, I'm actually just a novelist. <laughs> um, the the. One of the things I didn't talk about, I mean, your, your question's a good one. One of the things I didn't talk about was how uh, uh, government's policy, it can be formulated in an era of single issue advocacy. Because when you have all kinds of groups who just want one thing and don't care about the broad spectrum, you know, it's, um, it's a very odd and difficult circumstance. And, um, you know, within a household, every household has to budget for many conflicting kinds of things. But, you know, I look at, at some of the decisions that we've made in the regulatory area and I think, you know, I'm sorry. I mean, we live in a country where 40% of high school graduates are functionally illiterate. We live in a country where kids go through metal detectors on their way to school. I think that we're wasting a lot of money in a lot of areas. And, um, and unfortunately, people who have really have that one issue that they care about don't care about all the rest. I don't know the solution to that. Yes, sir. Uh, Robert Bidonato, Capital Research Center. Um, I'm curious, uh, and perhaps it might uh, be fruitful in thinking of how to persuade other people. Was there a, a moment for you in which you furrowed your brow and said, why has all of what I have been uh, taught in the past uh, seemed to be in error. Was there was there like a pivotal moment or some sort of an influence on you and your thinking that uh, started uh, drawing you into the direction in which you've taken on these issues? Uh, I think it has to do with just getting really old. Um, <laughs> when I was a kid, uh, you know, if you looked at a map of the world and happened to notice that Africa seemed to fit rather nicely into the coast of South America, such that they might have once been one piece of land and had then moved apart. You were told by your teacher that, yeah, they looked as if that might be the case, but that was simply a accident. It had no meaning. The continents did not move and were fixed. Now, I had trouble with that, you know, the, the way, you know, I don't want to bring religion, but I also had trouble with the virgin birth. But, um, <laughs> It, it just looked too much to be coincidental. And of course, by the time I was in college, it was all finished. You know, yes, there was continental drift. These things were on plates. It was all floating and moving. And it had, and had been for, you know, that's an enormous change. And, um, and when I graduated from medical school, one guy told us, and it was interesting, he told us in the fourth year, he said, uh, one quarter of what you've learned is already wrong. <laughs> So, so I have the expectation that, that a lot of what I read won't be right. It's, a, it's helpful. And yes, sir. I'm in your state of fear, and I was taken by the uh, motto taken from Quain, that the fantastic thing about science is that it gets such wholesale conjectures out of such a trifling investment of facts. And I'm wondering about your first question uh, about how you get unbiased and how you get sound scientific information because 
teaching as a philosopher of science, we live in an age in which we think that it's not just that the theories are not independently verifiable, they're not verifiable at all. And the facts, we're told, are value and theory laden, and somehow this wholesale returns of conjecture is really based on trifling investments of facts. And I'm wondering whether the politicization of science and the influence of policy on science may be a consequence of that, something that we've learned about science. I'm sorry, this is something that we've learned about science in the 20th century. We came into the century with the idea that we could physics will be over in just a few years and we'll just we'll, we have certainty about everything but we come out of the 20th century with the idea that um, well really it's just a matter of which paradigm you adopt and uh, one paradigm is as good as another mm -hmm. so I'm wondering whether the idea that if we just follow the data or just follow the information is really is really a sufficient policy to follow isn't it rather the case that there's so much contradictory evidence coming out of so many apparently no. credible sources. No, I don't think so. I mean, I agree. You were doing great, and now you lost it. <laughs> um, what, I, what you say is very true. Um, I, th I think up to a point. Part, part of the problem you're describing is that, is that most of academia has read too much French philosophy. But, um, <laughs> But I come from a very much harder tradition about science. I mean, I come from a tradition that says science is the, is the business of generating testable hypotheses. Now, it, it has demonstrably changed from that starting in the 1960s. You know, so you start to have interest in SETI, you know, which is a, many people have said is a, is a study subject without an object. Um, and, uh, and then you have string theory, which I'm told is completely untestable, but we're now in our second generation of physicists who are working in string theory. So um, all I would say to you is that the, that the verifiable, testable hypothesis still exists. I mean, it's of interest to me, for example, that if I say, I'm going to drop a, 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 um, a piano off the Empire State Building. How fast will it be going, and uh, and how long will it take to hit the ground? And um, and I send that problem to 20 labs around the world. They will give me an answer within a very small percentage of difference. They will be in complete agreement. And of course, they'll be doing S equals 1 half AT squared. It's Newtonian mechanics. I know all that. But the fact is, you give that problem to labs all around the world, and they're in complete agreement. If I ask them what will be the temperature in the year 2100, I get an enormous variety of answers, which suggests to me that the state of the science is, is a very different proposition. And, and, you know, I can rely on Newtonian mechanics. I know to get out of the way of that piano. I'm not sure how to feel about temperature in the year 2100. Talk about central planning is really not possible in today's knowledge society, and that uh, uh, at the same time you talk about forcing responsibility for knowledge, and uh, forcing around here usually means for us a lot of times federal laws, which it more or less is central planning. Uh, so how can how do you expect a marketplace? as opposed to central planning, to force responsibility for knowledge, which I guess you say has a, currently avoided the quality revolution that manufacturing has enjoyed. How do you do it? Um, it's interesting. Your, your question implies that the legal system is centrally managed, which I'm not sure I would agree with. It, it, <clears throat> I don't know enough to answer this, but it seems to me that, that, the, um, that the growth of legislation and the, the ideas of what's litigatable and what's not is in, in broad, in its broad overview, looking more like Blade Runner than it does like, uh, you know, things sort of pop up and emerge. But, um, and 
And to, uh, as examples of that, I would say that the, the changes that we've had in, in the definition of free speech, which you know, is, is vastly different from what it was 100 years ago. Um, <clears throat> not that I'm complaining about it. But, the, but I don't think that it's, it would be appropriate for me to say that I don't think we, we're going to have central governments and we're not going to have <clears throat> some degree of, of central management of things. I'm just saying <clears throat> that I don't think people are really looking at how vastly changed our society really is and, how, and the extent to which our, our kind of <clears throat> assumptions that we've carried with us for so long may not really hold anymore. That's all. So how would you force the responsibility? Oh, the same way that you force any kind of product liability. I mean, it's a law. Maybe it's a good law, maybe it's a bad law. You know, my, my fantasy is that someday I'm going to put on a baseball hat and it's going to have a huge thing on the inside, you know. Caution, if pulled down too far, may block vision, you know. Maybe, <laughs> maybe lost in wind, maybe do not use as a hat will be the final. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Hi, uh, my name is Anna Andrew Cohen. I'm from the Center for American Progress, but I was previously a staffer on Capitol Hill, and one of your early points was that sometimes staffers bring bias information. And my experience on Capitol Hill was that almost, I mean, more than I could talk to my boss about an idea, he came in with something he'd heard on the news or read in the newspaper or even read in a book. And so I wondered if you could touch on the responsibility of mass media to <coughs> com communicate unbiased information and maybe how well you think they're doing. <clears throat> I think you know, uh, uh, you probably know how well I think they're doing. Um, okay, maybe how, how they do <laughs> it. You know, I'm, I'm, I gave a talk to the press club in 93 in which I told them that they were out of the quality revolution, that, that they were um, that they were in desperate trouble, but um, they didn't care then, and they probably don't care now. The, I operate on the assumption that the mass media will never be accurate. I, I, I don't think they ever have been, you know. I mean, the, when, when did yellow journalism start? I mean, almost at the, at the beginning of American newspapering. And, and, and um, I, I don't see any reason for them to change. I mean, the great dictum of journalism is simplify and exaggerate, you know, which, uh, which is exactly what Walt Disney told his cartoonists. <laughs> I, I, I just think that we're going to have to, I do believe that uh, there will come a time, and it may come quite soon, when because of the internet people will be willing to spend a lot of money for verified information. Yes, ma'am, in the back. Well, Yeah, work on it. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. Just, just look. You know, um, I think I think that there are that there are um, there are groups of reporters. You know, who, who there are certain kinds of stories. That I'll, I'll give you a great example. Um, a recent one. You've probably seen. I don't know how to say her name. Uh, her name is Araskis. I think she's a a historian of science in the UC system somewhere, and she reported, uh, or she was invited to, uh, having given a talk, uh, she was invited to write an essay in Science Magazine, which has been widely reported, and it said that, that she had inspected the abstracts of 928 articles uh, on climate science from 1993 to 2003, and that she had not found a single one which disagreed with the notion that climate change was human cause, okay? Now, it's a, it's a really interesting situation. The first, uh, the first thing to know is when you hear 928 uh, articles in 10 years, you immediately think something's wrong. And in fact, the number is closer to 12,000. So 
somehow her keyword search uh, was, was inadequate. The second thing is that because the exact number of 928 was reported, it is possible to work out which keywords she used and therefore to go back and obtain the actual abstracts that she said she examined. People are doing this. And I'm told as a preliminary response that uh, the notion that none of them can, can contain any negative comment about global warming is far from the truth. Well, if you, I'm not a lawyer, although I pretend to be one. The, um, I think that you would have to make differentiations between the reporting of information and the generation of the information. But it's a, it's a complex thing. All, all I wanted to do is flag for people in this room that I think product liability for information is coming. If you want to know the exact details of how, you probably ought to talk to somebody else because it is being litigated at the moment, I believe. Yes, sir. Last question. I didn't, I didn't I frankly, I, I say it hesitantly, I didn't pay any attention to it at all. The, um, the kind of debate that I'm talking about is on a, on a very different level. When I was at the Salk Institute, um, Salvador Luria, who won the Nobel Prize in, I think, chemistry, and whose mother had had cancer all her life and had become a heroin addict because of her pain, and Luria had had this difficulty of obtaining heroin for his mom for all these years, he had a great interest in drug policy. And so he had a, he, he put together a conference on amphetamines and marijuana. And it was attended by all the important scientists in that area and a number of policy people. And sparks flew like nothing you ever saw. Um, but it was bringing the actual people together. The more you step away from the people who are, who are, who are really doing the work, they all know each other. They all know each other's positions, you know. They, and, and you start to get to the level of the science advisors or the groups that are trying to influence policy. Um, you know, is the Bush administration politicizing science? Well, it's a long tradition. They are not the first. They didn't invent it. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I think that uh, scientists, which is my area, I'm, I'm interested in science. I'm actually not very interested in politics. I hate to say it in this room, but um, the tradition that I was raised in was that politics is a sort of an inferior occupation. You know, it, it's, if you're not smart enough to do science, you can do politics. The, um, I understand, nevertheless, that politics is very important. You know, but I'm concerned that, uh, that science having, having ascended to really a phenomenal position of power within our society, um, has provided a temptation for, for people who are highly intelligent, but, you know, in the same way that doctors aren't good businessmen, scientists aren't good politicians. And, um, and they have been tempted to, uh, to join in the policy fray, where they really don't belong, where they do it really badly, and where they don't acknowledge that they are damaging science. You know, it, it's astounding to me. I opened up the Washington Post today. The lead editorial is about global warming. And it says, in effect, that even if the Bush administration doesn't believe the science, they ought to get with the program because of political considerations. The front page of that, of that newspaper today marks the 60th anniversary of Auschwitz. And Auschwitz exists because of politicized science, and it exists because of politicized science that started at the turn of the century, or the 20th century, in the United States, and, and policies that were supported by Theodore Roosevelt, the, the justices of the Supreme Court, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Louis Brandeis, um, 
tons and tons of people. Uh, and it can be phenomenally dangerous when you start to take a policy, it's something you want to happen, and begin to say it's science-based. Science has to stay independent. It has to stay focused on the data and what it knows, and it cannot be involved in where this is going to go. If it's In those days, it was immigration policy and the gene pool. Now it's something else. But um, it's a dangerous, dangerous gangplank to step off of, and I hope we don't. Thank you very much. <laughs>